Hey everyone, welcome to the E4 Bioscience Cannabis Lab Startup Webinar Series. I'm your host, Sean Opie. I'm the managing partner of E4 Bioscience, which is a boutique consulting firm that helps investors and lab teams fund, design, build, equip, operate, license, staff, and accredit analytical cannabis laboratories. And today, we're going to talk about the design and build part of that. So without any further delay, let's go. Today's Cliff Note slide answers the question, how much space does a cannabis analytical lab need? My standard answer is about 2,500 to 7,500 square feet with a very big red asterisk. And that very big red asterisk really gets to how much you are willing to sacrifice. As you go smaller, you have to cut important things out. So let's talk about what some of those sacrifices they are. And I'm going to present them in, in terms of questions. So my first one is, are you going to have an independent microbiology area for DNA extraction and amplification, and possibly even traditional culturing if, you're going, if your state requires that as well? Um, related to that, but on the, um, on the analytical chemistry side, are you going to have different areas for organic and heavy metal preparation? Again, the idea here for both of these is to get your prep work away from the instruments because the solvents, the acids, and some of the nucleic acid material that is used for controls have the ability to create false positives if you, know, you, you have some other problems in the lab and, and, and they're detected on the instrumentation side. So a really great way to avoid those false positives is to deliberately separate your setup and your, or your, your preparation and testing areas. Are you going to have what I consider smart workflow and good traffic control? Um, small labs tend to be very busy and people kind of shuffling in and out of areas and you don't want to bump instruments and you certainly don't want to bump people while they're working in instruments. And so I, I think that having a small lab really contributes to that. Um, and having hallways or a well thought out floor plan is going to minimize, uh, minimize those kind of interferences. The next two are together, private offices and um, laboratory analyst desk space. In a small lab, everything is in the open. People do their work at a bench counter. It works, but your lab director is not going to be very happy. It's hard to have private conversations in the laboratory. Furthermore, an analytical laboratory is loud. Um, there's a lot of instruments whirring in the background as well as the ventilation. And I think it's sometimes hard to focus and what the technicians are doing is knowledge work. They need to spend time to think. And I think giving them a desk outside of the lab but close to the lab is a wonderful, wonderful thing, and I always recommend treating your technicians well. Are you going to have storage space? In particular, not so much for chemicals, because chemicals have to go in, in, um, in the appropriate um, explosion-proof containers, or, or let's call them that. But what about all of your non-combustible or non-acidic consumables, plasticware in particular? And what about sample kits? If you are in a state that has to sample, if the laboratory is responsible for sampling, where are you going to build and where are you going to store those kits? Okay, employee changing rooms. Cannabis is a little stinky and some employees really like the option to change out of their day clothes and wear laboratory clothes that can be laundered. Another benefit of having employee changing rooms, and you, but you see this more often in, in cultivation, is that your clothes have microbial contaminants on them and they can be brought into the laboratory. So by requiring people to change, you are less likely to have a microbial contaminant false positive. Are you going to have secure indoor parking for sample receipt and sample transfer? Having a roll-up garage is a wonderful, wonderful thing. I get it. It's a, it's a cost that not a lot of people want to um, shell out for. 
but it really makes security, it, it locks down security, and um, if, if you live in a place where weather isn't wonderful all the time, like in northern Michigan perhaps, um, it allows people to get out of the cold as well. I think when people are doing original, original lab design, many times the janitorial closet is forgotten. It has to be built in. You're going to need to have a drain. You're going to need to be able to mop the floors. Uh, where does the extra toilet paper go? Sometimes it goes in the bathroom, but uh, it would be nice to have a janitorial closet. And then finally, I like to talk about future expansion opportunities. A lab that only has one set of analytical instruments is going to experience downtime. Um, and er everything will stop. You will not be able to get reports out. Uh, it, instruments are like cars. They, in a sense, they have engines. They need oil change. They need tires rotated. You know, and every once in a while, you're going to need to swap out the transmission. If you don't have a second set of instruments, you can't do that. If you haven't planned for a second set of instruments, when the time comes, the TIs are substantially more expensive because you're already operating. So I really like to emphasize when you're doing all of the work to build out your lab, really think about how many sets of instruments you're likely to have in the future because the number of instru instruments is the rate limiting factor for, for revenue. Okay, let's talk about some essential design elements here. We've already talked a little bit about work and workflow supportive spaces. Um, but outside of that, it's going to be essential that you work with your architect to adhere to both local and national building codes. It'll be for your mechanical or, or your ventilation, as well as electrical, plumbing, and industrial gases. Many of these are going to be spelled out by state regulations, and they'll be cannabis-specific. So read your application guidance packet. It's very, very important. Again, if you don't get code right, you'll go right back to step two. Um, and and you'll, you'll have to do the TIs over again. Casework and furniture, these are very personal. I like to use epoxy resin casework. Those countertops, they're corrosion resistant, they're burn resistant, um, but they cost a little more than stainless steel. Um, I prefer built-ins over movables, and I think that those are great selections for people that want to have Again, again, movable is great, but high-end laboratories, probably better to build them in and really think about your floor plan before you start building. Um, I know it's easy to move a table, but it's really hard to move an instrument. Um, other than the fact that you might have to revalidate it or do a mini validation, the power didn't move where you, ne you, where you needed it moved to. So get it right the first time. Obviously, in security, security and IT, in particular, the cabling is going to need to go in, and that's best done before the instruments in the lab. Um, dust falls out of ceiling tiles, and it's again, it's just disruptive. Um, safety. Labs have corrosive acids, flammable solvents, in some cases, explosive gases. This is not a C1D1 room that's, that's used for many extraction build, uh, facilities, but nevertheless, I think lab safety is very, very important. It's probably worth consulting with a safety expert independently to get some, uh, to get some feedback upon uh, how safe your lab is. And then I know I've said this before at least a couple times, but make sure that your lab is powered appropriately. Instruments pull a lot of amperages, so Get all the specs for them, understand the amount of power you're going to draw, and ensure that you have enough of it. Okay, how much of the TI is going to cost, or how much of the tenant improvements going to cost, and what does that include? I like to include most of the items on the right-hand side, on the, on the table, on, on the list on the right-hand side. Again, this is going to depend somewhat on your accounting practices. But I believe it should include your preliminary lab design. Again, that's probably going to be with a lab consultant. Um, once you've got the preliminary lab design, that goes to the architect. They'll make blueprints that can be sent off for to, to the GC, as well as being used for obtain, uh, obtaining your, your, your permits. The last four, it depends, on, it depends on where you are. But if you're going to pump gas, um, if you're going to generate your own nitrogen in zero air rather than use cylinders, again, highly recommended, but it's going to require that you plumb gas lines. Again, that's an increase in TIs. 
your casework we've talked a little bit about. Some people prefer to put that as a CapEx expense. And then landscaping and security. Um, the table on the left-hand side is an interesting table. Um, this is data that I was able to find from doing a, a fairly extensive search on laboratory builds and laboratory renovations. Now, for full disclosure, none of these are cannabis labs. These are all commercial pharmaceutical laboratories. Now, I believe that there's a lot of crossover between a commercial pharmaceutical testing laboratory and a cannabis laboratory, but it's virtually impossible to get numbers because cannabis labs are privately owned and there's virtually no public information about them. So I also have not met a single investor that has chosen to build from the ground up. They've all been renovations. So really it's the second column that's the most important column. And that little green box at the bottom gives the average of all the labs for which I was able to find data about $240 per square foot. That's an astronomically high number for most people because if you have a thousand square foot lab, that suggests $240,000 in TIs. Now, I don't think that that's way off, but I do think it could be off by a factor of two. To me, that just seems a little bit high. Um, and so if you look at one standard deviation on the low side, it's $172 per square feet. I think by the time you start adding all of these additional things, not just the, the, the contracting cost, you'll find that your TI costs will creep up. But it doesn't surprise me for one second to see TIs at $100 a square foot. Okay, what spaces does a cannabis lab need? Now, I've got, I need to get my laser pointer out here. Let's see if I can. Get my laser pointer, give me a second. Get my iPhone laser pointer connected to my computer. It's an awesome little, uh, awesome little app. Okay, here we go. So this is an image that was donated very graciously by my good friend, James Jager. Um, he drew it, it's an awesome diagram. And so thanks so much, James. I really appreciate you uh, allowing me to use this in this presentation. So first things first, it's 120 square feet by 120 linear feet by 120 linear feet floor pad. The whole lab is in that space. Um, the lab itself comprises about 7,500 square feet and the rest is exterior space. Importantly, the perimeter has a fence all the way around it contributing to security and a uh, remote controlled gate is controlled once again by security. Once a vehicle drives in, and in this case I'm thinking about a sampling vehicle, around the corner, here's the garage door. Again, the splurge that I just happen to love. It can pull in, at which point it can check in directly with the security office if you have a dedicated security office. And then samples can go through an intake um, so that the sampler does not need to come into the actual testing premises, into a sample intake area. Here there'll be accession into metric or biotrack THC, sort of the seed sale uh, software. And then they'll go into the storage area until the lab is ready to test them. Now you'll note that there's only one way in and out of here. It's through this door, again, contributing to uh, overall laboratory security. Once the samples come through, in this kind of blue area, this is the sample prep area. It's got benches and it's got a hood. And I think what's more important to note is that it is separated from the right-hand side over here, which is the analytical testing area. And you will remember that this is one of the sacrifices that people with small labs tend to give up fairly quickly, something that I really do not recommend. Uh, in fact, I strongly advocate against doing that. Um, so a, uh, a sample prep area and then a analytical testing area. Along the bottom, there are three offices. There's one for your lab director, one for QC, and one for your analysts. Again, I love the fact that they're close to the instrumentation, so they can be reviewing data, and if they need to, just take a couple steps out the door to check something and then drop back into their office. Uh, great design here. 
This purple space is microbiology testing. Um, this is done, uh, this is for a space that has traditional microbiology culturing rather than DNA-based methods. If it were DNA-based, I'd like to see a couple extra spaces in there for amplification and extraction as discussed previously. Um, there's a couple additional storage areas. You're going to need an electrical room um, as well as your general storage room, something we talked about earlier for consumables. This yellow are a couple extra offices and some conference room space. A good client is going to want to see your lab and it just gives a strange impression when you don't have a conference room to sit back in. So again, I highly recommend a conference room as well. There's a little pass-through changing area here. Again, this is to try to keep the lab as clean as possible. Um, you know, if this were my lab, I would have an SOP that says, in order to get through here, you absolutely must change. Can't go in for street clothes. Okay, um, going through the hallway, there's a small break room over here. Nice to have a big one, your workers will like you, but hey, a break room is a break room. And then a couple American with Disabilities Act um, uh, accessible bathrooms. Then finally, there's some cannabis, uh, waste, uh, cannabis waste storage area over here. And that, my friends, is just a really well-designed laboratory. Um, let's see if I can get the laser pointer out of the way here. And then we'll go back to the pro tip slide. So before you sign a lease, um, not a lease, a lease, excuse me, with an E, find somebody with lab design experience to help define your workflow, your space needs, and your instrument placement given the space that you're trying to lease or build. Um, many times these, these people will help you select a space that will actually work um, instead of signing a lease and having to back out of it because you're missing something. Um, get a list of equipment and all of the instrumentation power requirements, ventilation needs, and dimensions, including all of the attached peripherals as soon as possible. Um, it doesn't matter which vendor you're going to buy. I'll have a presentation about that a little later but you need all of these specs because you can't design the lab properly without them. You can make some pretty good guesses, but knowing exactly what you're going to buy is extremely helpful. Um, like I said uh, in, the, in one of the early slides, plan for at least two sets of analytical instruments. Otherwise, you'll be up the creek when you have some downtime, and downtime is a 100% certainty. And then finally, if it's possible, it's just strongly recommended to work with an architecture firm that has developed or built cannabis labs previously. Um, a toxicology lab is a good alternative um, or a, um, an environmental testing laboratory is another good option. If they haven't built with la uh, labs before, you know, buyer beware. Labs are, labs are complicated. If you like this presentation and you would like to get some more information, um, I just wanted to tell you that I was invited to be the primary editor for a textbook coming out called Cannabis Laboratory Fundamentals. It'll be available in Q1 2021. Table of contents will show you that it has a non-analytical section that talks about um, an introduction, lab planning, safety, licensing, quality, and also management. And then there's a number of technical chapters as well for, for people that want more information about that. Um, it's available on Amazon as well as Springer. Just search for Cannabis Laboratory Fundamentals and it's your first Google hit. We'd love it if you'd connect with us. My mobile number direct to me is 602-790-0842, but you can always email me with, by using Sean at e4bioscience.com. As always, we recommend that you check out my, our LinkedIn page and also our website. And with that, we're going to call it and say thank you very much, and we hope you learned something of value today. Have a great one.